All right. Um, this is for Olin. I'm going to be reading out of My Search for Yoga by David Williams. Copyright is 2019. And he is one of my most influential teachers. My Search for Yoga. You should write a book. Over the years, friends encouraged me to write down the story of my search for yoga. Whether it was in a casual conversation or in class, it seemed that there was this endless curiosity about how I went overland to India twice, how I became David Williams' yoga detective, searching to find what I felt was the best yoga system. Again and again, people said, you should write a book, especially Danny Living, author of Yoga, The Secret. The idea sounded overwhelming until I read an interview with John Grisham, one of my favorite authors. He said that if one simply writes one page a day, one will have a book in a year. That seemed possible. A journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. I ended up taking two years to write the initial manuscript. Diana Sargent and I spent another 10 years editing it. A few of the names have been changed or forgotten. The following is my story as I remember it 50 years later. From conversations with friends who were part of the story, if they write their accounts, our versions might be a little different. This is how I remember my journey. Chapter one. My guru's name was Booty. In the summer, in the summer of 1967, Booty and I were lifeguards at the seaside village of Ocean Drive, South Carolina. Our employer, Buck, provided a big old cottage called the guardhouse, where all the lifeguards lived together. By the luck of the draw, Booty and I became roommates at the guardhouse. Booty was the oldest lifeguard, and I was the youngest. He was 28, and I was 17 years old. We ended up being roommates for three summers. Guru is a Sanskrit word that means from darkness to light. Ancient Indian yoga scriptures describe a guru. Imagine two people are together in a pitch black dark cave. Both have a candle. The guru's candle is lit. The chela's candle is unlit. The chela, or disciple, has to follow the guru to see where they are going in the darkness. At some point, the guru touches the lit candle to the chela's unlit candle. Now the chela has their own light. With this light, the chela has achieved liberation while still in the physical body. They can walk into the darkness on their own. Essentially, this is enlightenment. I call Bodhi my guru because he lit my candle. He enlightened me. Bodhi told me, your only limitation is your imagination. Quoting William Shakespeare from over 300 years earlier, he said, all the world's a stage. Then he took it a step further, adding, and you can write your own script. You can go anywhere you want to go. You can do anything you want to do. You do not have to live a boring life like all the squares you have seen growing up. They will get old and die without ever doing anything exciting and without ever having any fun. Your only limitation is your imagination. If you can visualize it, you can materialize it. In Bodhi's life, he had been practicing what he preached. He was the only friend I knew who had been to Europe. He had lived in Las Vegas and dealt blackjack in a casino. From my limited North Carolina perspective, Bodhi was worldly, charismatic, and had more tales of adventure than any 10 people I knew. Without hesitation, Bodhi lived each day to the fullest, always present in the eternal now. As he told it, there was, a never, there was never a dull moment in his life. At the age of 30, Bodhi explained, give me another 15 years like the last 15 and I will jump into the grave at 45. Those summer months with Bodhi were a turning point in my life. I would be remiss if I did not mention that Booty was the only lifeguard I have ever known who did not know how to swim. Chapter two. 
My parents, David Livingston Williams and Pat Patricia Jean Patterson were born and raised in North Carolina. They met while they were students at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. My father was a natural athlete. He was on the swimming team and was a campus boxing champion at 156 pounds. My mother was an artist. My parents married after graduation. After my birth in July, 1949, my mother stayed at home to care for me. My parents were honest and hardworking. They gave my two younger sisters and me the best possible upbringing. At the age of four, my father taught me how to play checkers. At six, he taught me to play chess. I have played continuously since then. In 1993, I was undefeated in the Hawaii State Chess Championship. My mother loved to read and passed that on to me. We went to the public library every week until I was old enough to go by myself. Reading opened my eyes to a bigger world and inspired me to dream. I went to public school, was a Cub Scout, Boy Scout, and Explorer Scout. I attended Sunday school and was a member of the First Presbyterian Church Children's Choir. I played Little League Baseball and Pop Warner Football. I always made good grades and was selected for early admission to the University of Northern Carolina during my junior year of high school. Like my friends, I wore NAT, G-I-N-T, Gant, Gant shirts and Bass Weijin penny loafers. I conformed to the model that growing up in the South dictated at the time. I had one interest that did not receive my parents' support. I learned to play pool at the age of seven and I loved the game. There were two pool tables in our church game room. I played with the minister on Saturday mornings and anytime I had an opportunity. I begged my parents to buy a pool table. When they refused, I told them that when I had a home of my own, a pool table was the first thing I would buy to furnish it. If I could not afford both a bed and a pool table, I would buy the pool table. Today, I am fortunate enough to have a pool table and a bed. I knew or knew of just about everyone in my neighborhood, from the richest to the poorest. There was no one whom I aspired to emulate. I had no adult hero, real or mythical. As I saw it, the adults I knew were not getting older and wiser. It appeared to me that at the age of 40 or 50, they were complacent with their gradual decline into illness and senility. If I accepted this model, I visualized my future to be an inevitable, terrifying death under bright lights in a hospital. Inside me was a growing rebellion that would cause me to reject this eventually and motivate me to seek an alternate way of aging. Growing up, stories about American Indians intrigued me. According to legend, when an Indian knew that it was his time to die, he would go to a cave or a significant place in nature to make the passage to the happy hunting ground. Whether his death experience was real or mythical, it looked a lot more appealing than what was happening at our community hospital. My grandparents, Mama Nell and Daddy Fred, were a big influence on me, and I spent a lot of time with them. We always lived within walking or bicycling distance from them. I loved going to their home for meals. If I gave my grandmother a little notice, she cooked my favorite foods for me, and my grandfather made the best buttermilk biscuits I have ever eaten. Mama Nell, more than anyone else, gave me unconditional love. By using finesse in guiding me, she never put me on the defensive. She knew how to avoid polarizing me after my occasional misbehavior, so I was always open to her guidance. Perhaps she gave me my first instruction in meditation. I, always, I will always remember her saying, Davy, listen to your conscience and you will never get in trouble. Deep down inside, you know what is right and what is wrong. Daddy Fred possessed a wealth of practical wisdom. The advice he gave me still rings true today. Davy, figure out something that you love to do and are good at, and do that when you grow up. It does not matter what you do. You can do anything. 
just be the best there is at it. There is, no, there is a need for every skill. Find a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Daddy Fred further advised me, never work for someone else. Always be your own boss. Don't be in a situation where you are working and someone else is harvesting the fruits of your labor. He was always self-employed and he urged me to do the same. Chapter three. From childhood, I loved going to the beach with my family each summer for two weeks. The South Carolina beaches were a four hour drive from our home. I loved the beach and the ocean and everything about it. My favorite food was seafood. I begged my parents to buy a cottage on the coast. I envied any kid who lived in Florida had warm weather all year and could swim in the ocean on Christmas day. When I was 15, my Boy Scout troop went on a week-long camping trip to the beach. On Saturday night, our troop leaders drove us in a big bus from our campground to Myrtle Beach Pavilion. We were on our own for three hours. I paid 50 cents and went into the first rock and roll show, my first rock and roll show. The band was playing Carolina Shag music and everyone was dancing. I wanted to live at the beach. After my junior year of high school, I had a summer job at Cone Mills. My parents were friends of the owner. In early August, I quit and went to the beach for three and a half weeks. A friend's family had a cottage and they let us use it unchaperoned. That was the first time I was away from home for so long. After my senior year of high school, I was determined to live at the beach all summer. Taking it a step at a time, I told my parents that I was going to the beach for the weekend with classmates to celebrate graduation. I did not tell them that I was going to try to get a job at the beach because I knew they would object. However, I clearly did not want to stay in Greensboro all summer and work at the cotton mill again. My friends and I drove to Ocean Drive, South Carolina on Friday night after my high school graduation ceremony. I had a driver's license with my year of birth altered to make me look 18 years old. One of my friends did the forgery on his father's office equipment. That was all I needed for admittance into Buck and Japs Barrel, one of the most popular bars. To my surprise, one of the bartenders working there was Billy Joe, a friend from Greensboro. He was a few years older than I was. I knew him from the pool room. Mr. and Mrs. Cuball, where I had been playing pool and gambling for years. That's funny. Billy Joe greeted me warmly. He knew I was only 17, but he did not care. I had a fake ID and that was enough. When we had a break, we, when he had a break, we were able to talk. I wanna get a job for the summer. What does it take to be a lifeguard? I asked. Do you have your senior life-saving card? Yes, I have my American Red Cross Senior Life Saving Card and my American Red Cross Water Safety Instructor Certification Card with me. Billy Joe said, Buck, one of the owners of this bar, has the contract for the Ocean Drive Beach service. The season starts this weekend. Tomorrow morning, Buck will be hiring all the lifeguards for the summer. Be back here at 8 a.m. I will introduce you to Buck and recommend that he hire you. Bring your life-saving cards and be ready to work. If you get the job, you will have a place to live and two, meal, two meals a day at the guardhouse. The next morning I arrived early. I got the job and was on the beach by 9 a.m. By 4 p.m. I had the worst sunburn of my life, but I did not care. I had a job and a place to live at the beach. On Saturday evening, I moved into the guardhouse and met my new roommate and future guru, Booty. After work on Sunday afternoon, a few hours before my parents expected me to be home, I phoned and told them I was not returning until September, giving them my good news that I had landed a summer job at the beach. I promised that I would return in time to start my first year at the University of North Carolina. I told them that there was no use in arguing about my decision. Nothing they could say would change my mind. I was excited because I was following my dream to live and work at the beach. Fortunately, the call went down smoothly and my parents said it was okay. Buck, 
also offered jobs working at the barrel to lifeguards who wanted to earn extra money at night. In 1967, the legal age in South Carolina to drink beer or work behind a bar was 18. I told Buck my true age since I would not be 18 until July 19th. Buck did not allow me to tend the bar at the beginning of the summer. Ironically, he put me on a stool at the door checking the ID of anyone who appeared to be underage. This began the first of four summers living in Ocean Drive. I followed Daddy Fred's advice and I found a job I loved. Chapter four. My summer at the beach was more fun than I could have imagined. Keeping the promise I had made to my parents, I returned home the day after Labor Day. They drove me to Chapel Hill to begin my freshman year at the University of North Carolina. I first heard of yoga during the spring of my freshman year. I was a pledge of the Sigma Chi, C-H-I? Sigma Chi fraternity. One afternoon, I was hanging out with some of the other pledges and fraternity brothers. An upperclassman named Scott asked if anyone had ever heard about the yogis in India. No one had. He proceeded to tell us what he had heard. There are guys in India called yogis who live outdoors and survive on nothing more than a cracker a day and a thimble full of water. They sit with their legs crossed like this. Scott sat on the floor and folded his legs into lotus. I had never seen anyone do that, and I had never thought of doing it myself. Scott continued, this is called sitting in lotus. A yogi will sit like this for months, then an emergency will happen. With superhuman power, the yogi will jump up and save the day. Then the yogi will resume sitting in lotus. Yogis are the wise people of the East. They become older and wiser, not sick and senile like everyone else. Scott's statement might have been an exaggeration, but it got me thinking. The yogis that Scott described did not have to eat, or at least not much. Further, they probably did not have to pay rent. They were free from the shackles of the material world. I remember Booty's words. This is another way to live. You can go anywhere you want to go. Oh, there is, an, there is another way to live. You can go anywhere you want to go. You can do anything you want to do. Your only limitation is your imagination. Chapter five. In June, 1970, I took two classes during the first session of summer school. I spent the second half of summer school, I'm sorry, I spent the second half of summer at the beach. In September, I started my senior year. The Atlanta International Pop Festival was held over the 4th of July weekend. Woodstock was the most famous festival of that era, but Atlanta was probably the largest. At least 350,000 people attended, perhaps as many as 600,000. There was no way of knowing the exact number. Tickets were $14, but like Woodstock the summer before, Atlanta became an open festival when the promoters gave up on controlling the crowd and threw open the gates. My housemate Steve, my girlfriend Leslie, and I drove down to the Middle Georgia Raceway in Byron, Georgia, south of Atlanta, the site of the festival. When you, we arrived on Friday afternoon, there were so many cars that we had to park a mile away and walk. Approaching the gate, we were unprepared for the scene before us. Dealers lined each side of the road selling marijuana and a variety of psychedelics. Due to the competition, many were hawking what they had to offer like carnival barkers. Their lack of paranoia astonished me. Steve, Leslie, and I bought our tickets and entered. Once inside the fence, we realized the magnitude of the scene, the scene we were joining. I had never seen so many hippies. They were dressed in the wildest, most colorful clothing imaginable. In contrast, I was wearing cut-off khaki shorts, an Izod Lacoste shirt, and white tree-torn tennis shoes. Tree -torn. Due to the huge crowd, there was no way for us to get directly in front of the stage, but that was fine. We were happy just to be there, part of this enormous, peaceful mass of humanity. 
We found a place to settle in for the weekend in the shade of some trees off to one side of the stage out of the blazing sun. Psychedelic drugs were everywhere. Everyone was sharing. It seemed like the whole crowd was tripping. Nothing seemed threatening. The music lasted late into the night and the audience was ecstatic. On Saturday morning, the master of ceremonies, Tom Law, came on stage to start the day. I had never seen a male with such long hair. Tom had a beautiful blonde braid that reached halfway down his back. Where did this guy come from, I wondered, another planet? At that time, the Beatles had long hair over their ears and past their collars. As for me, I had not cut my hair in over two years not since the spring of my freshman year. Recently, it had gotten long enough to tie it in a ponytail. How could Tom Law have such long hair? He seemed to be about my age or a little older. He had not gotten a haircut in years. How did he get the idea? He had no role model that I knew about, but obviously he had started letting his hair grow years before the Beatles did. Tom greeted everyone and then said, before you get high on drugs, why don't you try getting high naturally with yoga? My ears perked up. My attention shifted from his long blonde hair to what he was saying. I was intrigued. I moved closer to the stage, as close as possible. Tom began instructing those in the crowd who were interested. He led us through a series of elementary yoga postures while telling us to do root lock and the breath of fire. Root lock was continuously contracting the anal sphincter muscles. Breath of fire was pumping the navel in and out while breathing rapidly through the nose and keeping the mouth closed. With hundreds of others, I followed along, contracting my anal sphincter muscles while stretching and doing the powerful breathing. The energy I experienced from these exercises amazed me. Indeed, I was getting naturally high. Tom led us for about 15 minutes. I kept feeling better and better. Of course, breathing heavily like that over an extended amount of time was enough to cause hyperventilation, giving one the feeling of being high. By the end of the session, my mind was blown. I had heard the term naturally high, but the words did not make sense to me as they seemed mutually exclusive. That morning, I experienced a natural high. Looking back, I recall a quote attributed to Lao Tzu. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The journey of a thousand miles in my life began with that single step, a yoga session at a rock festival on a racetrack in rural Georgia. Saturday was the 4th of July. Bands played all day and into the night. Jimi Hendrix played his rendition of the Star Spangled Banner at midnight, a fire during a fireworks display at midnight. This was the largest audience of Jimi's career and one of his last performances before his death from an overdose in London, England, 10 weeks later. His performance was the highlight of the festival. Again, on Sunday, Tom Law started the day with yoga. Now that I understood what I was trying to do, I immersed myself even more deeply in the exercises. I was captivated. By midday Sunday, the crowd began to disperse. Steve, Leslie, and I trekked back to Steve's car. My return to North Carolina was a return to day-to-day -day reality, but in my consciousness, the seed of yoga was sown. My major at Carolina was political science. Oh, chapter six. My major at Carolina was political science. My direction seemed to be toward law school. I would become an attorney and join the workaday ranks of the respectable and stable. I would drive a Cadillac, be a member of Greensboro Country Club, play poker on Wednesday night, play golf on Thursday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday. That never happened. Several landmark events changed everything. On December 1st, 1969, the United States government conducted the first lottery for the draft of military service. It was my junior year. All the brothers at Sigma Chi House on Fraternity Row, including me, anxiously watched the drawing on television. 
The days of the year were written on slips of paper. The dates were put in capsules, which were placed in a large glass jar. One by one, the capsules were drawn. The first date drawn was number one. Any male born on that date was at the top of the list for induction into military service. He could expect to have to fight in Vietnam. It seemed like a macabre, macabre bingo game, bingo game, gambling on one's future, possibly one's life. I was relieved. My date of birth, July 19th, was number 227. Everyone agreed that my number was high enough that it would be unlikely that I would be drafted. My housemate, Rusty, a close friend since junior high school, was not as fortunate. His was number 50, much too low. It was March 1971, a little over a year after the first draft lottery. Our May graduation date was approaching. Within a few months, Rusty expected to receive a draft notice. He had decided not to dodge the draft by going to Canada. He feared he might not ever be able to return to the United States. If drafted, he would choose to go to prison rather than go into the army. I came home from class one morning and found Rusty on our living room floor doing yoga. In front of him was Richard Hittleman's yoga 20-day 20 20 exercise plan. If Rusty were going to prison, he wanted a fitness program. He knew that one did not need any equipment to practice yoga, just a little floor space. Rusty was following Hittleman's instructions for the first day of his course. I put on a pair of shorts and joined him. That was my second step on the journey of a thousand miles. I began practicing yoga daily and I have continued without interruption to this day. Rusty and I completed Hittleman's course in 28 days. Yoga felt wonderful. What would life be like if one practiced yoga daily for 70 or 80 years? The only way I would find out would be to do it. Chapter seven. One of my girlfriends during my senior year at Carolina had friends in California who sent her the manuscript of a book called Be Here Now, several months before it was published. The author was Baba Ram Das, formerly Dr. Richard Alpert. After reading the book, she brought it to me. I started reading Be Here Now, and I could not put it down. Dr. Alpert and Dr. Timothy Leary were professors at Harvard University along with their graduate students. They pioneered psychedelic research in America. In 1967, Alpert traveled to India in search of yogis and holy men. He met and lived with the guru Neem Karoli Baba, who gave him the name Baba Ram Das. Wanting to share what he learned in India, Ram Das wrote, Be Here Now. In his book, Ram Das validated the message I received from Tom Law at the Atlanta Pop Festival. One can get naturally high with yoga. Yoga is ancient, at least 5,000 years old. It originated in India. In Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, written 2,000 years ago, Patanjali defined yoga as the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Yoga and meditation are synonymous. In India, one may hear someone say, he is sitting in yoga, meaning he is meditating. Yoga means peace of mind, clarity, awareness, alertness, sensitivity, being present in the here and now. That is why Ram Das titled his book, Be Here Now. Most people have never experienced yoga or even have a clue that meditation might be possible or desirable. The minds of most humans are in constant motion, jumping from the future to the past and back again. Rather than using the mind as a tool, most people are puppets of their mind. A guru is an individual who enlightens one to the fact that there is an alternative way of living. After I read Be Here Now, I believed that if Dr. Alpert could become a yogi, so could I. I was young, healthy, and not afraid to travel. I had never been further from home than Colorado. I did not know anyone who had been to India. 
those facts did not intimidate me. If I could visualize it, I could materialize it. My only limitation was my imagination. Reading Be Here Now motivated me to get a passport. I needed to find an expert teacher. If necessary, I would go to India, the source and home of yoga. I felt that a strong yoga practice would be essential for controlling my body, breath, and mind. I wanted to be a yogi. Chapter eight. Shortly after starting daily practice and reading Be Here Now, I met a fellow named Rick. He grew up in the mountains of North Carolina. He was living communally on a farm about 25, 20 miles outside of Chapel Hill. Rick invited me to visit him. I drove to the farm on a, sun, on a sunny Saturday afternoon in April. When I pulled into the driveway and parked, I noticed someone by the barn standing on his head. It was Rick. He had a blanket spread on the ground and he was doing a headstand with his legs crossed in lotus. I was impressed. I parked my car, got out quietly and sat on the grass near Rick. He gracefully uncrossed his legs, straightened them and lowered himself to a sit sitting position. He crossed his legs into lotus again and welcomed me to the farm. I thanked him and said, you're doing yoga, right? Yes, I've been practicing yoga for a while, but nothing as advanced as what you were doing. How do you know what to do? I've been learning from this book. Rick handed me a copy of Integral Yoga Hatha by Swami Sachdananda, which was on the blanket beside him. It was a large book with photos on almost every page. An elderly man with a long beard and long gray hair was pictured doing yoga postures. Swami Satchidananda's eyes seemed to twinkle. He appeared to be healthy and happy. That book was the next clue in my search. I asked Rich, I'm sorry, I asked Rick, will you teach me what you know? Rick said, I don't know that much, but I'll happily, I'm happy to share what I do know. Also, there's this guy named George who recently moved into a little cabin on the property down by the lake. He lives there with his wife and baby. He knows a lot more than I do, and he has been teaching me. I will introduce you to George. I was excited. Can we start tomorrow? It's Sunday and I don't have classes. Sure, said Rick, come out again tomorrow. We chatted for several hours and I met the rest of the people who lived on the farm. I returned the following day and as often as I could over the next few weeks. I practiced yoga with Rick and George, together and separately. I was a sponge soaking up every drop of information either of them offered. Each day, get up and do your practice, Rick advised. Try to be a yogi while you are doing your yoga. Focus on what you are doing. Suspend thinking and increase your awareness and sensitivity. Yoga means meditation. Meditation is simply the space between the last thought and the next thought. Once you start thinking again, you are no longer in yoga. Dismiss any thought that arises and return to silence. Once your mind gets used to yoga, it will look forward to it and be comfortable in the space between the thoughts. Rick continued, when you have finished doing your practice, lie down in corpse posture, direct your mind toward an even, even deeper state of yoga. Stay in corpse until your heartbeat is back to normal. Your breathing is back to normal and your temperature is back to normal. Then your session is over. Gently and consciously stand up, walk out into the world in a state of yoga. This state will last for a few minutes and then you will be the same old jerk you always were, he said with a wry smile. Don't worry, day by day, do your yoga practice and afterwards try to stay in a state of yoga longer and longer. Gradually, you will become a yogi more and more each day until you are in that state of yoga all the time. Years later, I read a verse in the Katha Upanishad written over 2000 years ago, which corresponded to what Rick told me. It said, when the five senses and the mind are still and the reasoning intellect rests in silence, then begins the highest path. This calm steadiness of the senses is called yoga. 
then one should become watchful because yoga comes and goes. After I began practicing yoga with Rick, I saw a program on educational TV that exponentially increased my motivation to learn yoga. It was a documentary about an Indian yogi named Swami Rama. Doctors Elmer and Alice Green met him in India. His yogic powers were so impressive, they brought him to the Menninger Foundation in Topeka, Kansas, where they tested him and recorded the tests on film. Numerous devices monitored Swami Rama's heartbeat, pulse, and body temperature. On camera, he decreased his pulse in one hand and then the other. Next, he increased the temperature of one hand and then the other. He slowed his heartbeat almost to a dead stop. Finally, he did something even more amazing. By concentrating and staring at a pinwheel in an airtight glass box, he made it move. Seeing that, I knew I had to learn yoga. I have one other memory from my visits to the farm. One afternoon, I was lying in the grass by the lake with a friend. As is common with university seniors, we were contemplating our futures. And my friend said, all I want in life is to not be hassled. His statement was simple, but profound. It made me reflect, what did I want in life? I realized I simply wanted to wake up each morning where I wanted to be and do what I wanted to do all day long. That was a monumental realization. It has guided my life. Chapter nine. The first weekend of May, 1971 was the biggest party weekend of the year for students at the University of North Carolina. Two weeks later, final exams began. At the same time, Americans from all over the country were planning to gather in Washington, D.C. to protest the war in Vietnam. Although I was aware of the upcoming event, I had not considered going. Friends from the beach had been arriving since Wednesday. Our small house was full and people, people were camping in the backyard. Laura, a friend from Greensboro, arrived early Friday afternoon. She was very attractive and we got along well. She was my date for the weekend. In February, we had hitchhiked to New Orleans for Mardi Gras and stayed in the French Quarter at the home of a friend from Ocean Drive. At 5 p.m., I answered a knock at the front door. Two boys and a beautiful girl were there standing on the porch. They introduced themselves as Jesse, Mitchell, and Amy. They were students at the University of Miami and were en route to Washington, D.C. A mutual friend had given them our address. Can we crash on your floor tonight, asked Jesse. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we're driving to Washington to join the protest against the war in Vietnam. If you can find space on the floor, you're welcome to join the party, I said. You've come at a perfect time. Spirit and several other bands are playing on campus tonight. It's going to be great. As we were speaking, Amy and I locked eyes. It was love at first sight. I had a dilemma. Laura was there to be my date for the weekend, but now I wanted to be with Amy. Getting up my nerve, I asked Laura to join me in my bedroom. I said, hmm. Listen, Laura, there's something we need to talk about. My mind was racing. What was I going to say? Laura, I have a problem. I would like to be with Amy and get to know her. Before I could continue, Laura saved the day. That's great because I want to be with your friend, Steve. An awkward situation had resolved itself. That night, Amy and I went to the concert together. The magnetism between us was palpable. I found out she was a yogini, a female practitioner of yoga. Her teacher was Yogi Rama. He was in his late 60s and taught free yoga classes in a park in Coconut Grove on Sunday afternoons. Her description of the class made me want to go to Miami. After the concert, we walked back to my house. We talked late into the night. I asked Amy to stay for the rest of the weekend. No, I still want to go with Jesse and Mitchell to Washington. There are four seats in Jesse's Mustang and only three of us. Why don't you come with us? 
It took me about one second to, to decide. Wherever you are going, I will go. I packed a few things and off we went that Saturday morning. Jesse drove all day and we reached Washington, D.C. late that afternoon. His sister was a student at American University, so we slept in her dorm room that night. On Sunday morning, we drove to West Potomac Park, a short distance from the Washington Monument. The protest was going, had been going on since Friday afternoon, so thousands of people were already there. The stage was set up and a band was playing rock and roll. The scents of patchouli and incense were in the air. We walked around, taking in the scene. This was the first time I participated in any form of political activism. I felt united with the youth of America who wanted to end the war in Vietnam. Suddenly, the energy changed. It was as, as if the sky had darkened and a storm was imminent. People were running in all directions. There was panic and confusion. I looked around and understood. A multitude of police dressed in protective riot gear had surrounded the park and were moving toward us. They were determined to disperse the crowd. Brandishing clubs, they hit anyone who opposed them. On television, I had seen the police beat people at peaceful civil rights demonstrations. In 1960, one of my earliest lunch counter sit-ins was at Woolworth's five and 10 cent store in Greensboro in my hometown. Uh, let's read that again. In 1960, one of the earliest lunch counter sit-ins was at Woolworth's five and 10 cent store in Greensboro, my hometown. Now I was among the people at risk of injury or arrest. Disperse we did. I was terrified for myself and everyone around me. I had never been exposed to such danger in my life. We were the youth of America, our nation's future, and the police were attacking us. As thousands of people stampeded in every direction, the four of us held hands and ran. We reached Jesse's car, fortunate to have made it to safety. We jumped in and made a speedy exit. Each of us was in shock. In less than 30 minutes, I plummeted from optimism to depression, brought on by the violence we witnessed and barely escaped. The feeling that America's political situation was hopeless overwhelmed me. Chapter 10. Jesse and Mitchell took turns driving south. For the first few hours, there was little conversation. Each of us was contemplating what we had just experienced. As we approached the Virginia-North Carolina border, Amy asked me, do you want us to drop you off in Chapel Hill or do you want to come to Coconut Grove and stay with me? It was an easy decision. Final exams were in two weeks, but I was not worried. Since this was my last semester, all of my required courses were behind me. I was only taking slides to finish getting the numbers of hours I needed for graduation. We drove all night and reached Miami on Monday morning. The weather was hot and there was not a cloud in the sky. I was happy to be in Florida. Best of all, I was still with Amy. Jesse drove into a parking lot of a modern high-rise apartment building near the marina in Coconut Grove. We emerged from the car, exhausted after hours and hours of driving. This was where Jesse and Mitchell lived. Amy was a freshman and had a dorm room, but she told me she seldom stayed on campus. We went upstairs and Amy showed me her room, a third bedroom that Jesse and Mitchell let her use. The apartment was nice, nicer than I or any of my friends at Carolina had. Jesse and Mitchell obviously came from wealthy families. I called Rusty and Steve and told them I was in Miami. After a nap, Amy took me on a tour of Coconut Grove in her two-seater MG sports car. Her parents had given it to her for high school graduation. We had two fabulous weeks together. I loved the Grove and I loved Amy. It seemed like the feeling was mutual. On Sunday afternoon, Amy and I walked into Peacock Park for her yoga class. Yogi Rama, Amy's teacher, was sitting in lotus on a picnic table, dressed in loose white Indian clothing. He had on a turban and he also had a long gray beard. 
who personified my idea of the archetypal yogi. Huge trees surrounded the park. We found a shady space to put down our towels. At least 100 people placed their towels on straw mats on the ground in a semicircle facing Yoga Rama, Yogi Rama. That was my first real organized yoga class. I looked around and saw a group of healthy, smiling people. As a newcomer, I experienced no self-consciousness. People made comfortable eye contact with me and I felt welcome. Sitting on the picnic table, Yogi Rama said the name of an asana and gave instructions on how to do the posture. He occasionally called on students by name and asked them to demonstrate. Within a few minutes, it was obvious who his regulars were. After an hour or so, the asana practice ended. Everyone laid in corpse posture and closed their eyes for Yogi Rama's guided meditation. He spoke in a soothing voice, leading the group into a deep state of relaxed awareness. Close your eyes, calm your mind, be emotionless, be ambitionless. I snapped out of my my revere, my reverie. I snapped out of my reverie. What did he say? Be ambitionless? I had never heard that before. All of my life I had heard, you have to strive to get ahead. You must climb to the top. The old yogi's calming voice gradually faded away and we spent a few minutes in silence. Eventually we opened our eyes and slowly sat up. The class was over. Yogi Rama never asked for any money. Some people gathered in groups and began quietly talking. Amy and I gravitated to George and Dan, two of the more advanced students whom Yogi Rama had most frequently asked to demonstrate the asanas. I introduced Amy and myself. Did you hear that thunder? I introduced Amy and myself and the four of us chatted about the class and yoga in general. George and Dan asked if we wanted to walk with them to another section of the park where Hare Krishnas were serving free veg a free vegetarian feast. While the food was being served and eaten, many of the Krishna devotees and members of the crowd were dancing and chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I had seen Krishna devotees handing out their literature on the sidewalk of Franklin Street in Chapel Hill, but I had never been among so many of them at once. I never imagined that people would serve free, healthy, delicious food in a public park to anyone who wanted to eat it. I was already a vegetarian. After visiting a poultry farm during my senior year of high school, I quit eating chicken. Then in my junior year of college, I meant met a girl named Nancy. She and I hitchhiked down to Fort Lauderdale for spring break. Nancy told me, you would be mellower if you quit eating meat. I really liked Nancy and wanted her to like me, so I went along with her suggestion. Our romance did not last, but with the exception of seafood, I stopped eating meat. On Tuesday, Amy and I attended a smaller class in the living room of Yogi Rama's home. I met his wife, Sita, their names were those of two of the main characters in the Hindu epic, the Ramayana. They were sweet, generous people. Their home was small, but clean and well-maintained. The class was not an asana class like in the park. We discussed the theory and philosophy of yoga. The more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. The path of yoga looked like a journey into the unknown and I was ready to go. Amy and I practiced yoga together every morning. Occasionally, she left for a few hours and went to class. We drove to different beaches in the afternoon and swam in the clear, warm ocean water. The days passed quickly, and soon it was time for me to return to Chapel Hill for my final exams. Amy's exams were coming up as well. Amy drove me to Interstate Highway 95. North. We said our sad farewells, but not goodbye. We had a plan. As soon as we finished our exams, we were going to reunite and hitchhike around Europe for the summer. What could be a more romantic way to pass the summer and fall more deeply in love? Chapter 11. 
Hitchhiking back to school was easy. I had a smile on my face and a sign that said UNC Chapel Hill. Drivers quickly picked me up. Rested and confident, I took my exams and made straight A's that semester. It was the only time while I was at Carolina. My parents drove to Chapel Hill for my graduation ceremony. I told them I was going to Europe for the summer. I did not mention to my parents, but I had been pondering my options for the future. My government's response to the May Day protest against the war in Vietnam had shocked me. Did I want to be a taxpaying member for the military industrial complex contributing to a budget that, spent, that is spent primarily on defense? Or was it offense? Certainly it was offensive to me. After finishing her exams at the University of Miami, Amy drove north in her MG and picked me up at my house in Chapel Hill. When I said goodbye to Steve and Rusty, I told them it might be a while before I saw them again. I was having doubts about living in America. Maybe, in, maybe Amy and I would find somewhere better once we left the United States. Amy had some bad news. Her parents had refused to allow her to go to Europe, to Europe with me. Amy was undeterred. She was going anyway. Her passport was at her home in Buffalo, New York. We would simply go to her house during the day when she knew her parents would be away at work. She would get her passport and leave. She had several hundred dollars saved in the local bank that she planned to withdraw for the trip. With my savings, we would have over $3,000. We took two, two days to drive to Buffalo. Midway, we stopped at a roadside motel and spent the night. We timed it so that we pulled into Amy's driveway at 2 p.m. As she had predicted, no one was at home. Amy went into the house to get a passport. It was gone. Obviously, her parents had hidden it. It was time for a new plan. After withdrawing her savings from her bank, Amy and I drove to Niagara Falls, New York. Amy applied for a new passport. She claimed that hers was lost. She paid for a replacement, plus a little extra money for rush delivery. It would be ready in three days. We drove to Toronto where we could stay with my friend Billy until Amy's new passport was ready. Billy was the brother of Leslie, who had gone with me to, it, to the Atlanta Pop Festival the previous summer. This was not my first trip to Toronto. During the Thanksgiving holidays of my junior year, I hitchhiked up to Toronto to, and visited Billy for a week. He was a draft dodger and had been living in Toronto for two years. In 1971, Americans did not need a passport to enter Canada. So Amy was able to show her driver's license to cross the border. Billy was surprised to see us and happy to have visitors. Billy's apartment was in Kensington Market area. Amy and I practiced yoga each morning and then walked for hours exploring the city. We found flights from Toronto to Barcelona, Spain for $100. We bought two tickets departing in six days. After three days, we returned to New York and picked up Amy's new passport. Then we drove to her home and parked her car in the driveway. She left the keys on the kitchen table with a note to her parent, with a note to her parents telling them not to worry. She said we were going to Europe for the summer, but she assured them that she would be home in time for school in the fall. Then off we went. We hitchhiked to Niagara Falls, crossed the border, and returned to Billy's apartment in Toronto. Finally, the day of our flight arrived. We were excited to cross the Atlantic Ocean and see Europe for the first time. Chapter 12. Amy and I flew all night and landed in Barcelona mid-morning. It was June and the weather was hot. I could not wait to swim in the Mediterranean Ocean. I'm sorry, the Mediterranean Sea. From the airport, we took a bus to the train station. We wanted to go to the beach. At the station, we fell into conversation with some other young travelers. One fellow confidently said the place we were looking for was Sitges, S-I-T-G-E-S, Sitges. It was half an hour train ride from Barcelona. That sounded good to us. When our train pulled into Sitki Station, a group of six of us emerged. We were all there for the first time. 
As soon as we stepped into the street in front of the station, local residents approached us offering rooms to rent. A woman solicited our group offering the entire top floor of her home. It had six beds, which would be perfect for us. The total cost was $9, $1.50 each. Our apartment in the, women, in the woman's home was nice. Everyone agreed it was a bargain. We put on our bathing suits and headed down to the beach. All my life I had heard and read about the Mediterranean Sea. I waded out and dove under the surface. The cool salt water was exhilarating. I was happy to be there. After a couple hours at the beach, we returned to our lodging, showered and hung out until dinner time. When we decided we were ready to eat, we all walked into the old town center looking for the perfect restaurant. We passed several and then one drew us in at the door. We had a wonderful meal that lasted for hours. Although my experience was limited, the house wine was the best I had ever tasted. It came from a huge barrel and cost 10 cents a liter. We slept soundly that night. The next morning, we woke up totally rested and headed down to the beach to start the day with a swim. After swimming, as we walked back to our room, I recalled my epiphany by the lake. For the rest of my life, I wanted to wake up each morning where I wanted to be and do what I wanted to do all day long. I was doing it. My only limitation was my imagination. Amy and I did yoga in our room packed and put on our knapsacks and then took the train back to Barcelona. We caught a bus to the harbor and after a little searching, we found the ticket office for the all night ferry to the island of uh, Ibiza, I-B-I-Z-A, Ibiza. We purchased two cabin class tickets. They were a little more expensive than debt class tickets, which most young travelers bought. Our cabin was tiny but we were able to sleep. We disembarked at 6 a.m., rested and ready for whatever Ibiza had to offer. We had the address of a girl named Mandy who had been living on Ibiza for several months. She was a friend of the people on the farm in North Carolina where I had practiced yoga. They had given me her address and encouraged me to visit her. The address I had for Mandy was in a small village about 30 minutes by bus from the harbor. We arrived there by 7 a.m. People were just waking up. We found the, the address, but we were surprised to discover that it was a restaurant. I had Mandy's name and address on a scrap of paper, which I showed the owner of the restaurant. Yes, he knew her. She picked up her mail there, but she stayed a few miles further down the road near the beach. He gave us directions. We thanked him and went back to the road to hitchhike the rest of the way. In a few minutes, we got a ride in the back of a three-wheeled bread delivery truck. I had never seen such a small truck, but it was fine for getting, a, getting us to our destination. After a scenic ride through the countryside, we arrived at the little house Mandy was renting. She and her Swiss boyfriend, John, greeted us. We gladly accepted their invitation to join them for breakfast. We had some time before eating, so Amy and I did a little yoga. After breakfast, John went across the road to inquire about a room for us to rent at a small eight-room pension. The little hotel was full, so they put my name on the waiting list. Mandy and John said we could sleep on their living room floor until a room was available. At 10 a.m., the four of us walked a short distance to a beautiful sandy cove. The beach in front of a little open-air cafe became our hangout for the next 12 days. We spent most mornings and afternoons there, lying on the sand and meeting young travelers from different countries. When the midday sun got too hot, we sought shelter in the little cafe. I was sitting in the cafe one hot, still, sleepy afternoon when I heard the most beautiful music on the cafe's speakers. The music reflected the setting so perfectly that it made a lasting impression on me. Later, I heard the music again and immediately recalled it. The piece that moved me so much was La Mer by Claude Debussy. I love Debussy's music since first hearing it that day. After two nights with Mandy and John, we moved into a little hotel. The rooms were small but clean and only a dollar a day. 
The food was good and inexpensive as well. Travelers were met at the beach. Travelers we met at the beach enchanted us with tales of places they had visited in Europe and beyond. They talked about traveling in Asia and North Africa. The stories that interested me the most were the ones about traveling overland to India. When autumn came and Europe got too cold for camping comfortably, one could travel by bus through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, West Pakistan, and into India. The total cost for bus tickets from Istanbul to New Delhi was $14. After arriving in India, one had the choice of going north through the Himalayas to Kathmandu, Nepal, or going south to Goa. I had heard about Kathmandu, but I never imagined going there. Goa sounded like a mecca for hippies and young travelers. We heard there were miles of beautiful beaches places to stay for pennies a night, and an endless supply of marijuana and hashish. Every day I learned things that expanded my imagination. I was getting an education in geography that was relevant to my own life. There were so many places to go and there was so much to see. I wanted to do it all. We stayed at a little beach on Ibiza for almost two weeks, and then we decided it was time to move on. The running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain was starting in a few days and we wanted to go. All right, I'm gonna stop there for now. Thank you, love you.